It's awesome. Cheers, bro. Here we go. Well, kia ora tato and uh, kia ora ngā whānau te motu nei. Hello to the family here and uh, hello to those who are watching online. Good to be here, eh? Yeah. Wasn't it cooler this morning? Did anyone find that? Very good. Okay. Today is going to be a roller coaster, and uh, the last three weeks I've been living in my own world after hearing a, a guy, Pastor Stefan, give a message about politics. And I kind of thought, you know, it was kind of like a permission card. This really needs to be discussed in the church. So I've got 28 pages of notes, and um, these are summary notes as well, and I'm going to be able to deliver probably the equivalent of, uh, you know, six or seven of them uh, with you right here. But this will be like drinking water out of a fire hydrant. Um, this is, and this is not about motivating you. Uh, this is probably more about informing uh, so we can be engaged as God's people. Uh, we live in... Uh, an incredible nation, we're a sovereign democratic state. Uh, the concept of democracy, demos uh, means people, and krisi means rule. So democracy is about the rule of the people. This is government from the people for the people. The opposite is government for government, right? In other words, where the people are there for the benefit of the government. So, so we are in an amazingly privileged position. Uh, most governments in all of human history have been top down. Um, most governments in the world today are top down. But New Zealand is a democracy, which means bottom up. So how do we get democracy? Where did democracy come from? Can democracy be threatened and lost? And what does that mean for us? Uh, that will be our roller coaster in the next 30 minutes. You got it indeed. <laughs> Okay, we're going to start with Israel and the type of government that God intended for the nation of Israel prior to the time of the kings. The first thing in Israel, and I'm giving you a list here so you know where we're going to start off, was that God's intent was that they have no king on earth because God was to be their king. And this was basically a covenant model, and a covenant is a triangle. What you've got is me and my wife getting married in the covenant of Christian marriage, and God is at the top. So God defines the rules, he defines the boundaries, and we are accountable to God and motivated by what he says. Covenant. The difference or the contrast to a covenant is a social contract. A social contract is, is where you've got me and my wife entering a civil union with no God within the picture. So there's no higher moral ethic or code we have to follow. There's no one higher than ourselves to keep us accountable. It's just us and each other. So this is the difference. Now, Israel was in a covenant sort of model of government with God as their king, but this doesn't mean that they didn't have government or governance or laws or rules or boundaries or police or enforcement. Everything sat underneath us, and here's some points to summarize for you, um, really from the Mosaic law prior to the time of the kings, um, lived out through Moses, Joshua, and uh, the book of Judges. They had a shared value of equal justice. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, you shall not be partial in judgment. You shall hear the small and the great alike. You shall not be intimidated by anyone. You shall not therefore rule in a judgment because someone puts a bribe in your hand. You shall therefore not give freedom to this person because they are in power and prosecute this person because they're weak and they're poor. Right, You're supposed to be equal, and in case you don't know, most justice and most of history has not been like that, and most justice on planet Earth today is not like that. It is a smaller part of the world we're privileged to be a part of, that is. Um, number three, human rights are to be recognized. Genesis chapter one, male and female were created in God's image, uh, and we'll talk more about this soon. Point four, there is to be equality even for non-Israelites in Israel. Leviticus 19, you shall treat the stranger who sojourns with you as the native among you, and you shall love him as yourself, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. In other words, do this. There was religious tolerance. It's notable that Israel never waged ideological war upon another nation to convert them to their faith, nor ideological war upon an individual living amongst them to force them uh, to convert and uh, embrace Jewish religion. Sixth, there was a system of honesty in the society, which, provide, which, which is the antithesis to corruption, which provided a safe basis for commerce, which enables prosperity to abound. The Leviticus 19, you shall have just balances and just weights. 
And in case you're not aware, uh, in most empires through history, it, it's those, those dollar notes inside the handshake that have made things happen. Uh, this is more standard than not in history, and this is true probably of more places than not in the world today. And any of the rest of you, if you've traveled, uh, I've certainly been in places where I've got plenty of stories of, of corruption and, and how things operate. Uh, number seven, this one's amazing. They had a bureaucracy-free welfare system. When you reap the harvest of the land, do not reap to the edges of your field. Do not gather the gleanings. That's the second harvest across it. Don't go over your vineyards a second time or pick the grapes that have fallen. Leave them for the poor and the foreigner. I am the Lord your God. In other words, do this or else. Now, this system of care for the poor actually gave dignity to the poor because they didn't get money for nothing. They had to work for it, going out to the fields, following in the wake of the harvest, and uh, they could therefore survive. But even more profound in the system of uh, welfare in Israel, Leviticus chapter 25, we have the year of Jubilee. So after every 49th year, all slaves were to be set free, all debts were to be released, and all land was to be restored to their original owners, as given out by God through the tribes earlier on. What this means is, if you have become rich and you're coming up to the year of Jubilee, you might have lots of lands that you've purchased, you would transfer your wealth into jewels and gold so that you can retain your wealth into the next era, the next period. But if you are poor and you've made bad decisions and you've ended up in debt, and because you can't pay your debt, you and your wife and your children have become slaves, in that year of Jubilee, you would be released, the debts would be gone, and you would be restored back to your original lands and given another chance. This is really profound, because in summary, what you've got is a bureaucracy-free, tax-free, self-regulating, restorative welfare system which far outstrips anything we have here in New Zealand. However, we have a welfare system where probably 95% of the nations of the world don't, so we also still have it phenomenally good, just to keep all things in perspective. But where do these ideas come from? Uh, Eight, they had relatively few laws. Uh, Kind of nine, very little need for police. Everyone was taught the law and was personally accountable to enforce it. No prisons. The law instead required swift justice at the gates and there were cities of refuge uh, for various circumstances. No standing army. Every man had to know how to carry a sword or to shoot a bow. It's possibly the first nation where everyone was taught to read. To give a comparison, in Egypt, um, they had 3,000 hieroglyphics. That's like letters to their alphabet. And so only about 1% could read because it's so complicated. By the time Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments, they had a 22-letter alphabet, which is so simple, you could even teach that to children. And so people were required to read and to know the law and parents to teach the laws to their children. And final point, it was a democratic nation. This is first uh, uh, talked about in Deuteronomy 1, being unable to make judgments on all legal cases. Uh, Moses gave the instruction, choose for your tribes wise, understanding, and experienced men, and I will appoint them as your heads. This was government from the people for the people. To notice this, this was bottom-up government. Uh, That means government from the people for the people instead of the opposite. But here's the catch, which is the conclusion of the sermon, um, but I'm not going to stop right now. Um, And that is that the only way to sustain this was for every citizen to be educated, moral, and to participate. And this is the catch of a democracy, because our democratic system has given us, made us a nation, arguably with some of the, the best equality in all of human history, some of the greatest prosperity in all of human history, and with the greatest freedoms in all of human history. This is an absolutely incredible nation to be living in. But can these freedoms be lost? Absolutely they can. And how do you sustain them? Well, you've got to look at where they come from, because it actually comes from an ethical, moral framework. Lose the idea of God in that framework, and suddenly everything's in the balance. You see, second part of my message, there's only 34 parts, it won't take long. Um, Where did our concept of human rights come from? Uh, I've already mentioned this in reference to Genesis 1, we're made in the image of God. But to define more what our human rights are, the Ten Commandments actually give it to us. Now the Ten Commandments are moral boundaries for a society. 
and they've been misinterpreted 30, 40 years ago as limiting our fun, you know, so we don't kind of like them. But this really flips it upside down and completely misunderstands the point. You see, do not murder says, in terms of human rights, that you have the right to life. You have the right to the protection of your life, no matter who's in power and how powerful they are. You have the right to feel safe within a community because you shouldn't be scared of having your life taken away from you. Do not steal says that you have the right to private ownership of land and possessions. This, therefore, in one sentence, counteracts the, the, the philosophy of communism, which is about the, the government ownership of land and the means of production, meaning business. Um, do not commit adultery. Your, is your right in a balanced society to be in a marriage where you're not at fear of being betrayed, but more so it's about the rights of children to grow up in a stable home environment that will help produ to produce good mental health and good emotional health. To analyse the Ten Commandments as a whole, I suggest that the first three are about God's rights. God says, I am God, I made you, and you are my creation. I have the right to be worshipped, that you worship no idols, and you don't misuse my name. But the next seven are about our rights. And to, to look at the Sabbath as an example, it's not made for, the, for, for, for God, it's made for us. For example, if I ended up being a slave, the law of the Sabbath says that I still get a day off and get rest. It's pretty important. But it also says that I deserve to be recognized and known for who I am, not just for what I do. The fact that you rest from your work says that your work doesn't define your core identity. Yeah, um, Vishal Mangalawadi is an Indian philosopher who critiques uh, Hindu-Indian culture and its class, caste system, uh, but also who critiques Western culture. And if you can excuse a play on words, which is really dumb, but democracy, demos, people, chrissy, meaning rule, the rule of the people. Um, uh, you could also say that it's a demonstration as to how crazy we are. And that's really what Vishal Mangalwadi would say when he looks at Western society. He says, here you are in, in arguably the freest, most prosperous, um, and most equitable civilization, which New Zealand is a subset of, in human history, and you're throwing it away because you don't understand what you got or how you got it. Um, he says, there is no freedom without the rule of law, because otherwise my freedom can be used to take away your freedom. As an illustration, the United Nations Declaration on Human Rights was penned by Eleanor Roosevelt, who was a Christian. The only thing is that when they put it together, they had to leave the name God out, because they wanted this to be a declaration of human rights that would be applicable to all people of all different religious persuasions. The problem is that these values mean nothing if God doesn't exist. We should like the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights because they reflect Jewish Christian values. Um, but if we're just advanced animals, as Charles Darwin has supposed, then a human is just an advanced animal. You're allowed to kill animals. The end can justify the means. And as an illustration... And the OIC is the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. And in the year 2000 in Cairo, they looked at all of this and said, what gives you the right to tell us what human rights are? And they decided to create their own list, which for them included the right to Sharia law, the right to subjugate women, and the right for men to beat their wives. So how did these freedoms become ours? To, to give you a, an overview of the history, uh, it wasn't by mistake. It didn't magically appear. The Hebraic or the Hebrew template uh, from Moses and the Old Testament sits there as probably the only empire or nation prior to Christ within which this, these kinds of freedoms existed. Because you have to have belief in a God to have a basis for human rights and the obligation of government to limit its power to protect people. Um, you come through to Jesus asked, should we pay taxes to Caesar? And he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Now, there's quite a bit of thought in that statement, but one of the important points is that it says there are things that are not Caesar's. This is uh, the concept of the limitation of power. Governments don't exist for their own ends. That's the growth of power, the growth of bureaucracy, the growth of laws, until all of you down there are just paying taxes and helping us, the upper class, the ruling class, uh, to govern and have great freedoms while you, the, um, the ruled class, suffer. Government exists for the freedom of the people to protect their rights and their opportunities because they are created individuals in the image of God. This comes through and begins to have its effect through Christians in the 300s. 
Constantine becomes a Christian and stops the Christian persecution. As an illustration, about 60 years later, Emperor Theodosius is in power and he has embraced Christian belief. There is an uprising, a rebellion, and he goes and squashes it and he basically massacres a whole lot of people to stop it. He comes back home and he wants to go to church and he's met by the pastor at the door and his name was Ambrose. And Ambrose says, you're not allowed in here. And the emperor of the known world says, what are you talking about? I'm the emperor of the known world. He says, you do not realize how great your crime was. Your hands are stained with blood from an unjust massacre. Now at any other point in human history, Ambrose would have lost his head. What's remarkable here is that he doesn't. The ethic of Jesus and of the Hebrew template was beginning to have its was beginning to get into everybody within a society to create a context within which human freedoms could be respected and there would be a limitation placed on the power of government. In 890, King Alfred the Great, the only monarch of England ever to be called great, made the Ten Commandments and Jesus' golden rule, uh, do to others as you'd have them do to you, the foundation for the rights and the freedoms of the British people. A couple of hundred years later, in 1215, the Magna Carta was an agreement between the king and the barons or lords of England who each overruled different people themselves. And they were kind of saying, we're not just here to give you taxes and everything you want so you as the king can sit high and mighty and free and rich and wealthy and enjoy life. You've got a responsibility to protect the environment within which we are free. And we can rise up and fight against you if you won't recognize that we have rights. And so that agreement was broken very shortly afterwards, but was recreated with many of the monarchs that followed for the next few hundred years. The ideas of the Hebraic template and of Jesus were getting into the minds of the people, creating a context. And these thoughts were taken to Germany through Calvin, to Scotland through John Knox, to to Ireland through St. Patrick, to America through the battle for independence, and to New Zealand from our English sort of origins, uh, from which we have got our values which are biblical, related to human rights and related to democratic government. And in terms of establishing whether we're a Christian nation, in my mind there's no question that we are, because our values are not Islamic values. Our values are not Buddhist or Hindu or Taoist values. Our values are not atheistic values. Our values as a nation are soundly Christian in their origins and foundations. And in terms of the first sitting of our parliament, in case you're not aware, the first parliamentary debate was about who would open in prayer in New Zealand's history. Because if you let the Anglican open in prayer, which was the thought, the problem is that that might make us like England, in which the Anglican church was married to the state, with the the monarch as the head of both the church and over the government. And so to ensure we had a separation of church power from state power, which is another matter, which is good, church power shouldn't overrule, um, They didn't want to let an Anglican pray. So the solution was to send someone down the street to find the first clergyman, the first pastor they could, and to bring them back and they opened in prayer. And that's how the matter was resolved. So incredible privilege. You live in a nation with freedom, with equality, uh, with unbelievable prosperity. But can it be lost? Democracies have citizens. Kings have subjects. The French Revolution is where we got our concepts of left and right from, by which we we have our vocabulary for explaining politics. Uh, It it didn't exist before that. It it was defined on the basis of those who sat on the left of the um, seating arrangement in the French National Assembly, as contrasted with those on the right. Those on the left had embraced a a few new philosophies, and they thought that if they could overthrow the monarchy, um, the government, and the religious order, which is the church, then they could create a utopian perfect society that would actually be free and uh, where people would be better off. Uh, The problem is that the book about um, the island of Utopia, I think it was called, written a few hundred years prior, um, about this idyllic socialistic state, uh, the word utopia actually meant nowhere. And I suspect that this was the point. What followed in 1793 was the French Revolution. And instead of producing equality and freedom, it produced inequality as well as tyranny, uh, a lot of suffering and death. Our two key thinkers in the background to this were Voltaire and Rousseau. In 1728, Voltaire articulated a strategy uh, which became the pathway to the French Revolution. It was about a 60-year build-up to it. Uh, And it was principally a systematic plan to destroy Christianity because Christianity validates the freedoms of the individual, which is the basis of democracy and, and freedom as we understand it. 
This included the removing of Christian art to replace it with abstract art, the mocking of Christian beliefs through public media, the overthrowing of religious orders, and the fabrication of books under the names of people who were already dead to sell them cheaply to try to influence the thinking of the masses. Once religion was largely removed from French culture, reading here, the naive citizens were slow to realize moral restraint was gone. Lawlessness and chaos would therefore follow, out of which the dictator would arise. Uh, under the monarchy, uh, with, with government and the church, they had around about, um, about 700 executions per year. Uh, in the beginning of what was called the Reign of Terror, it started with tens of thousands of executions, collecting the royalty, the wealthy, the farmers, the business owners, and the clergy, and killing all of them. But it then moved to killing hundreds of thousands of people because not everyone agreed with their wonderful equal free society. For example, a whole lot of Catholics in the province of Vendi, um, and there were a slaughter of a few hundred thousand there um, because they wouldn't agree. And it was boasted that they did not leave a single man, woman, or child alive. But it didn't stop there because the chaos increased and ran out of control, so much so that they said, we need someone to rescue us. Enter the dictator, Napoleon Bonaparte, who to me has always been a comical ca character because I love um, Rowan Atkinson's sort of dramas and, and these sorts of things, but who in history is a bloodthirsty dictator. And so from about 700 being executed a year, it went to tens of thousands, to hundreds of thousands, and then to millions, because he then led them to attack other nations, resulting in millions of deaths. And this pattern has repeated itself multiple times in our previous 150 years. There are 55 nations alone which uh, lost their freedoms to communism as, as satellites of, um, uh, of Russia and communism uh, during the Cold War, as an example, and they lost their freedoms. Even today, um, Venezuela had significant freedoms in the year 2000. When it was taken over, it lost its freedoms. By 2010, it was on the hit list for places where the freedom of the press was basically gone. And today, the average Venezuelan woman spends 10 hours per day in a line trying to get food. And the irony is that they are said to have the biggest oil reserves anywhere on the earth, and uh, they were the richest nation in South America. And yet their people today, with all that oil, are in poverty. A second foundation to all of this was Rousseau, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and a French-speaking person could pronounce it better than I. His basic idea was the opposite to Christianity. He said human nature, instead of being bad and evil, is actually essentially good. People are naturally loving, virtuous and selfless. It is society with its artificial rules and conventions that makes them envious, hypocritical, and competitive. Man was born free everywhere. Man is in chains. And one last quote that you've got up there. Every citizen, if we can overthrow the hierarchy of the religion and the government and the monarchy, then, then the, the, the innocence of children will naturally come through. And every citizen will then be completely independent of all of his fellow men and absolutely dependent on the state. This was socialism. The individual rights, you see, are esteemed if you believe in a God. But if you remove the religion, then on what basis do you say an individual has rights? No, the greatest good is the social good, socialism. And the problem is that while socialism begins with the promise of equality, it, it's basically a bait and switch. Because it says, I want to give you equality, give me the power. But once I've got the power, does it actually work? The French Revolution illustrated that it didn't. Socialism didn't work. There are only five uh, communist, uh, communism, sorry. There are only five communist nations on the planet uh, that are left today, as an example. You see, Rousseau's theories were all well and good, except that they were wrong. Even John Lennon, the musician, understood we all have a bit of Hitler within us. At school, you might have read the book, The Lord of the Flies, as a student. It shows the great evils even children are capable of when left to themselves. Friedrich Nietzsche, a key thinker who influenced Hitler, um, he put it this way, God is dead and we have killed him. How shall we, the murderers of all murderers, comfort ourselves? Now to unpack that, he's not saying God was alive and now is dead. He's saying we've rejected the idea of God. We don't believe in him. The problem is on what basis do we say anything is now right or wrong? It's just up to us. So we've murdered even the idea of murder itself. On what basis do we say murderer, murder is wrong? We're the murderers of the murderers. Not because we're killing them, but because we've killed the idea that says they've done anything wrong. 
So what hope do we have left? Because what will limit the wrong that we now do and become capable of? And history last century demonstrated the truth of that. Uh, Russian novelist Fyodor Dostoevsky, who wrote um, The Brothers Karmakov, which I might have mispronounced because I've only read these things, um, said, can man be good without God? Now the answer is no. Not because an atheist can't do something that's good and charitable, but because you've lost your basis for defining the word good. Uh, if God is dead, anything is permissible. And to give a critique of all of this from Chuck Colson, without God, there is no basis left to say the state must treat its citizens justly instead of unjustly. There are no moral limitations on the state's use of power. And so what followed from the Russian Revolution was a history of revolutions. And uh, Hegel was a key teacher in this, and, and there's not time to go into it. He, he was a teacher of Karl Marx, who wrote the Communist Manifesto, and, and that's where all of that comes through with, with Lenin and with Joseph Stalin, each producing more um, deaths than the, the previous. But also Nazi Germany was an application of Hegel's socialism. Uh, he studied it and he loved the thoughts. The Nazi Party is an acronym for is it the National, National Socialistic Workers' People's Party? It's something like that. It is socialism. But, but Nazi Germany is called fascism compared to communism. And to give you a distinction on those two, a lot of it's just words. It's, it's got no real meaning. For example, communism says it's about equality, but in the end you've got a ruling class and a ruled class, and, and uh, if you're not on the right team, you're dead, right? Whereas on the, in fascism, they start with a premise that we will have a ruling class and a ruled class. That's the difference. So it begins as racist, like Germany. Uh, we're going to have us as the Aryan race. Or it could begin as class-based, which is how Italy did it, instead of race. That the class at the top is going to continue at the top. But the truth is that both of them end in inequality. Both of them end in a loss of freedom. Both of them end in economic bankruptcy within the nation. Uh, both, both of them end up in incredible uh, suffering. So... I'm at my transition point where in the first service I also struggled to try and pull things together. Can I have the next slide to tell me where I'm going? Okay, how do we make sense of this? Plato lived 400 years before Jesus. And Plato therefore didn't know about Jesus' radical teachings about servanthood, you know, selfless love, the, the greatest is the one who serves. Jesus flipped ethics on its head in a profound way that's changed history and has given us our democratic freedoms um, and much more. Plato looked at all the different types of government and he thought to himself, nah, I think this idea of democracy sounds good, but it's never going to work, and so he gave up on it. And the next slide here, this is the outline of his train of thought summarized. Democracy seems good because it seems to give people their freedoms. The problem is you treat people um, equally, who are actually equal and unequal alike, to quote. So, in other words, there's people who are more intelligent than others, there's people who are more hardworking than others. Our equality of opportunity, we all get to go to school, we can all choose to start a business, we can all work hard. Unfortunately, equality of opportunity doesn't produce equality of outcome, because some are more successful than others. Now, the problem with this is that if there's greed in a society and a lack of charity, which there was in the ancient world, one historian I read of couldn't find a single example of a charitable organization existing to help the poor prior to the time of Christ, as an example, then, then basically this gap becomes less and less until the poor say, we don't have equality, uh, and they want all the government's money. And once they've got that, they want all the rich people's money. So you can tax the living daylights out of them to pull them down, but eventually you're going to have to overthrow them because they've become powerful. In which case you've got anarchy and you've got chaos. And then out of the chaos, someone needs to rescue us because now we're all killing each other and everything's terrible. And out of this comes the dictator or the tyrant. And he said, this is inevitable. You can't stop this flow. So, so give up on democracy. It's never going to work. The best you can hope for, says Plato, is the philosopher king. And to give, you, give it to you in different words, it's the benevolent um, dictator. This is a dictator with a kind heart who kind of looks out for you. And this is what his island of Atlantis was all about. This ideal socialist state in which you owned no possessions, you owned no land, there was a ruling class and a ruled class, but the guy at the top was kind of kind-hearted. But he said the chief problem with this idea is this. One day the benevolent dictator will die. So who will take power? But you see, he had to reject the idea of democracy for a simple reason. There was no ethic or value system on earth that could compel people to relinquish power 
and to give away their wealth. You see, capitalism is your right to invest money and to keep your return on investment. That's capitalism. So at its base level, it's a freedom, and it's a great freedom. You have a right to get an education, to work, to start a business, and to keep what you earn from that business. The problem with capitalism is that if the love of money gets hold of you, it can actually become the cause of many evils. And so where does this take us? If we go to the next slide, here's our lineup. You might line up the political parties of New Zealand differently to myself. Entirely up to you, you don't have to agree. But how as a Christian am I supposed to make sense of this? If we were to analyse, and that's, that's how I think we have to make sense of it, um, if we were to analyse even parties that sit here like New Zealand First, when you take a moral issue, only one votes conservatively, the rest vote liberally, off to the left. If you took the ACT Party, um, no one votes conservatively when it comes to the moral issues. Yet they believe that human rights need, and freedoms need to be protected, but, but not for babies or for old people you know, who might want to kill themselves. Right? And, and the craziest thing about this line is that off to the left you go to socialism and into communism, and to quote William Federer, um, communism is just socialism light. To quote Anne Rand, who has authority to speak on this topic, um, communism is just a matter of how you rule people. Uh, socialism seeks to rule people by vote, while communism seeks to rule people by force. Right? So, so you've got there. But here's the crazy thing. On this scale, we're told that fascism, like Nazi Germany or Italy, sit off to the far right. As if you go this way to freedoms and you become a Christian, and I would have thought that Jesus would be at the far end of that one. But no, 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 dictatorships and killing us. But, but, but isn't, isn't fascism applying socialistic philosophies from Hegel and Machiavelli and all these others exactly the same as this? It's just that they start off by being honest and saying we're not going for an equal society. You see, this doesn't make sense, and so I've come to a conclusion. Cross out left and cross out right. And I think there's a quote here from, from Ronald Reagan in 1964, which is profound, and given the number of pages I'm going to read from here because it's easier to find it. I suggest to you there is no left or right, there is only an up or down. Up to the maximum of individual freedom consistent with law and order, and down to the ant heap of totalitarianism. You see, on the left, George Orwell, who wrote the book 1984, said, what is the object of power? The object of power is power. To give people power doesn't work unless they have a moral ethic inside them that says, I am here for the good of the people, not just for the sake of power. Um, C.S. Lewis said, I'm doubtful whether history shows us one example of a man who, having stepped outside of traditional morality, meaning Christianity, and attained power, has used that power benevolently. Uh, to quote uh, Patrick Henry, 1877, at Virginia's convention to ratify the US Constitution, can the annals of mankind exhibit one single example where rulers overcharged with power willingly let go? A willing relinquishment of power is one of those things which human nature never was nor ever will be capable of. So, so a pursuit of power, if there's not an ethic to say I'm here to serve the people, doesn't work. But next slide. But, but capitalism and the other side doesn't work either. Um, Sholaniski um, has authority to make statements on this topic. And what he said is, untouched by the breath of God, both capitalism and socialism are repulsive. Because under capitalism, you've got greed, which leads to your equal opportunity becomes... Um, inequality because one works harder or is more intelligent or whatever, and then you've got power and corruption. So to bring you to a conclusion, you've got four votes coming up, and I want to suggest to you a couple of quick thoughts on what you can do. Number one, you've got to have a person vote. This is a politician that you will vote for. Can I encourage you, look at the values of the politicians. Look at their history of voting, because that tells you what kind of a man or woman you are, that they are. That's what you're voting on. That will tell you also how prone to compromise they are. Now, not all compromise is bad. I will compromise drinking a coffee sometimes to have a cup of tea, right? But some compromise is bad. And without belief in a God, the further you get away from that idea, the further you away are away from protecting a nation from corruption. Secondly, you've got to vote for a party. Can I encourage you, you need to look at the policies of the parties. This is to say, please do not vote on tradition, which is what you voted for last time. 
Please, please do not vote on what benefits you the most with the last minute promises. Those are bribes, right? And uh, it's a lack of intelligence on your part, and it's selfish on your part. Um, I, ha- I had a third in my head. Anyway, I forget it. What you need to vote on um, is the policy. You need to vote on what's right and what's wrong. You need to vote on who will have integrity and has a vision for our nation that will limit the powers of government and protect the rights of the people. Because that's the biblical framework from which our democracy has come, bringing equality, prosperity, and freedom. You have two final votes. Now, I've tried very hard to be nonpartisan throughout this, right? And um, you can have Christians potentially in all the parties. You have to work it out. I'm not going to be a nonpartisan on the next two. You've got a vote on cannabis and a vote on euthanasia. I would simply encourage you regarding the cannabis bill, um, this is not about medical cannabis, that's already legal in New Zealand. Um, Are we really going to succeed in keeping uh, the uh, cannabis-laced lollies and fizzy drinks away from teens and children? Uh, Why are the police so much against this, and why are so many in the medical field and so many in the mental health area opposed to this? Regarding euthanasia, um, I would point out simply that This is not about limiting pain for people who are sick. That's called palliative care. It's a different topic. We have great palliative care. Maybe it can be better. Campaign for that if you want to. Uh, Regarding euthanasia, how many unjust deaths should we tolerate? Because we know they will come with this. To point it out, one of the key arguments against the death sentence is the fact that you will end up with unjust deaths. So how many should be tolerable? Also, why are so many in the legal community against this law? Also, why are so many medical practitioners, and especially those involved with the elderly, uh, against this law? God initiated democratic government. The Bible is our basis for saying human rights exist. Jesus taught through that simple statement in a very tense environment under the Roman occupation about the separation of powers. We are called to be salt and light. While the church of God as a power structure must not marry itself to the state, it would be compromised by doing so. Every individual Christian has to be involved with politics because God cares about people and politics is supposed to be about people. We are called to be salt and light. You live in one of the most free nations on planet earth, one of the most prosperous nations on planet earth, one of the most equitable nations on planet earth and in all of human history. Can I encourage you as Christians that I believe you have a responsibility to be engaged with the issues of our nation. You are citizens of this nation. Remember, democracies have citizens, kings have subjects. Be a good citizen, vote, pre-walk your way to the voting booth with your family. Pray for our nation, look at the policies first, do some thinking, and uh, may God's favour continue to be on our nation, because this really is a great place to live. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your wisdom and the um, Hebraic template for government, including even a welfare system better than ours, and ours has a lot going for it. Uh, Thank you for the wisdom of scriptures. I pray you would help us as your people to be wise, uh, that we would be involved, and we would pray, Lord, for the continuing of our freedoms in this nation, uh, for the welfare and freedom of this people. In Jesus' name, amen.